Welcome to Business at the Speed of Coffee, the one show about business for business by business. Have you often wondered when people quote public policy positions, where they got the background to the information they're using? How accurate is that information? And indeed, does anyone pay any attention to it anyway? Well, sitting behind a lot of New Zealand's public discourse sits valuable research. And one such body that produces this research is the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research. Now, some people might think it's a government department. Actually, it's not. It's actually populated by a lot of really smart people. And there's one guy that's been running it for a while, Laurie Kubiak, is with me here today. Now, Laurie and I are having coffee the other day, and it occurred to me that you might want to know how the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research actually came about and how it works. Now, you might be surprised by Laurie's background. Welcome, Laurie Kubiak, to Business at the Speed of Coffee. Good to be here, Kim. Now, Thank you, you haven't always lived in New Zealand, have you? No, I lived overseas for, I think it's 27 years altogether, but I, I'm, I am a Kiwi. I'm a South Auckland boy, Mangari, and uh, I, uh, one of the great ironies of my life is I never intended to go overseas when I did, and uh, because I have no British background, I, I went right. to London. Um, I was saying at the time, two years tops, that's it. I'll, I'll do two years in London and then back home for me. And I, that was what I thought at the time, and I ended up staying 27 long years. So you grew up in Mangere. Where yeah. precisely did you go to school? I went to Ngaiwi Primary School on Mascot Ave, which is just down by the Mangere Town Centre. Um, this was all being built at the time. This was, oh, know, really? I'm, I'm remembering the, the 70s, yeah, it was all being developed. And, and then Arahanga Intermediate School, where there's now a motorway, and that was on Beta Drive. And I finished my schooling at Otu College. I went out of zone for that. Oh, really? And, and uh, did you go to university after that? I did. I went to Auckland. So it's, I'm, all, I'm a local product, all local, all Auckland. And what, what did your mum and dad do? Dad worked for New Zealand Rail. Well, he had two jobs. He, he was an immigrant, so he's the half of the family. The Kubiak side of it. Isn't yeah, it? <laughs> he's, he, he, he's Polish, but he, he'd lived in Australia before he came to New Zealand. And he'd lived actually in the United States and the Netherlands before that. And there's a long story behind that. But uh, when he came here, he was a cleaner at the university chemistry department for, for a few years. And then he landed a job with New Zealand Railways in the, in the Otahu Railway Workshops, for those who remember that, uh, main freight's there now, I think. And uh, he was a shop blaster and metal sprayer for them until he retired. You know, this is a story of social mobility, really, to be honest. And I have to say, Dad would be very proud of you today, I think. I don't think he... I never thought he got what I did. I mean, the... <laughs> He, no, honestly, I mean, the, uh, I think one of my other brothers was much more of a success in his eyes than I was because my younger brother, Chris, became an academic. And, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and Dad got that. And, uh, but I, I, I became half an accountant. You know, I, I did uh, SEMA at night school, again, here yeah. in Auckland, at Tech, as it then was. And that's what I took overseas with me and just did contract accountancy gigs for the first couple of years. So you're a bean counter at your core? I, not at my core. No, I tunneled out of that as soon as <laughs> I decently could. But uh, that is where I started. I started counting beans, like every other yeah. Kiwi in London. You know, yeah. you, six weeks here, three months there, yeah. the, traveling in, in the gaps in the middle. and. Uh, and that was the deal. As I say, I didn't intend to go there, but I thought, you know, once I'm here, I'll enjoy what I'm doing. And, and that was it. And at the end of that period, I, I ended up staying a lot longer. But no, I did start out counting bees. Beans. Did you study anything else? At uh, university. Yeah. I studied music at university. Um, uh, but otherwise, the accountancy I did at night school, as I say, it was taken those <laughs> Very days. Very relevant when we get into a discussion about public policy. Yeah. Um, so what on earth... You know, now you're running a, a very prestigious research organisation. Mm. So before we talk about your role there as, as managing director, I guess, or chief executive, what is and does the New Zealand Institute of Economic Research do and what does it look like? We're a, that's a very good question because it is an unusual beast in some ways, but we are a commercial consultancy and a commercial advisory business. Any government involvement? Uh, no. Uh, we, people think, as you said in your introduction, yeah. that we're a sort of tiny corner of the yeah. Reserve Bank or perhaps Treasury. Untrue. No, um, we do contract research for government, but we also do contract research for the commercial world as well. The proportions of that varies across time. Uh, but the commercial part of the business, I would say, is, is growing, partic particularly as we're now up here in Auckland, which is the first thing I did when I joined the Institute yeah. five years ago. Um, but no, um, commercial advisory, commercial um, 
consultancy on economics, on policy, in the commercial world that's normally strategy or perhaps investment, um, any of those areas where economics has a strong contribution to make. When, when I returned back to New Zealand, it was surprising to me that the profession of commercial economists didn't really exist here, but I had a corporate career overseas, and uh, that's how you populate the strategy departments yes. of the large corporates in, in London or Frankfurt or wh wherever it ha happens to be. Were you really smart at school? I mean, it sounds to me like you're doing very well at an early age here. You must have been a particularly clever person, or what is it about well, you was particularly? Was I smart at school? Um, I, I was reasonably smart. I mean, we were streamed at Otoo College, and the, the, the top stream was called the R stream, and I've no Reserve. idea what... Re uh, Remove. Well, we always said retarded, but the <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was in that stream and I, I sort of jockeyed around with 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 the others. But um, no, I, I don't think I was I don't think I was any kind of absolute genius back at school. But uh, so you're mov moving through corporate things, then you decide to come back to New Zealand mm. because of family reasons or or, or, or whatever. Yeah, well, that, that's a big question, actually. I mean, we, we wanted to come back for years before we actually did it, because we've got three children, yes. and, uh, and they were all born in London you know, during, during my, my years there. Um, I'm, as I touched on, I'm not British at all by background, so for me, going to the UK and going to London was never going home. I didn't have relatives no. everywhere, or anything like that. Dad is Polish, as I said, and Mum's as Kiwi as a big Ben mm. pie. You know, she's half Maori, and the other half came back in the 1840s. Right. So, um, so I don't. You know, it's not going home for me. Um, but yeah, so from about the early 2000s, we thought, how can we get back? And two things really stood in the way. The first was that corporate yeah. uh, merry-go-round that you mentioned. You know. The, the way it works in a, in a big outfit like, um, like BT is if you're in that stream, if you're in the talent pool and all that stuff, um, you know, the, the assignments last typically about three years and for the first six months of those three years, you're both trying to figure out if you should be fired because you don't know how to do what they're <laughs> expecting you to do. And then you're on plateau for maybe 18 months and then six months after that, the next one's coming over the horizon. And once you're in that world, it's very, very hard to jump off it. Mm. Um, the pay is pretty good. The pay is pretty good. The it's varied and interesting. I I, I enjoyed the international mm. world, and um, as I say, once I joined Global Services, which uh, it's actually the largest division within BT. You know, BT yeah. has a much bigger international business than it than it does, than any of the British businesses are individually. So I was, you know, crossing the world, and my, my last job was in strategy, and um, and that was that was terrific. But I always wanted to come home and. We, we have things in New Zealand that we just didn't have in London. Did you find, as many people returning from overseas, particularly as long as you have, mm. that suddenly things seem a bit small? Mm. They are small, yes. It's, a, it's um, five million people as of some point next year. I mean, that's, uh, you know, you put yeah. three of those into London. <laughs> you know, three inside the M25 anyway, the ring road that goes around <laughs> London. <laughs> They're all there. So, but so, so you've had this world experience of you. So we're now mm. back in New Zealand mm. and... Um, and let's focus on the Institute, mm. um, populated by a bunch of very smart people. I can yes. say that for you. I know many of them are very smart. Uh, and now focusing on largely research and public policy. Mm. Um, how does that feel after sort of trying to make money for a big telecommunication company, for instance? Oh, it's different. It's very different. It was a complete, complete de departure for me. Yeah. Um, how does it feel? The work is endlessly interesting because we get across the, where NZIR is a really terrific institution. Is you're right across the commercial world, you're right across the government world. It's a sort of it's a point at which every local and uh, natural government. Uh, local, uh, we we do less in, in local government actually. We do more for central government than okay. we do for local government. But uh, and the commercial clients are from all sectors. Can you that describe you can some of the recent big projects that are not too confidential? Yeah, the the ones that aren't hampered by confidentiality. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's always that's always a challenge in a business such as ours. One that acquired a certain profile was the work, and it's topical at the moment. We work the work we did for the ports of Auckland just just yeah. down the road here. So you part of the most recent study? Um, no, no, not the Upper Brilliant. North Island freight, freight study that the government commissioned. No, we worked for the port oh, yeah. on what would be involved in moving the cars from the waterfront and, you know, what cost that would be. Quite the grainy economy. detail, in other words. Very detailed. Uh, we also do some things that are less detailed. So we did an interesting piece that was also in the airwaves recently, which looked at uh, the value of water and um, 
how you arbitrate between the interest groups that have an interest in wow. water, tourism, That's a farming. fault line that's opening up, isn't it? Oh, yes, and, and that's, that's going to run and run because it's not easy for, for a country like New Zealand. So you can't see a clear pathway through that? No, I think it's enormously complicated. I don't think there's, there's any script that you can follow that delivers you perfection. Does it mean we're destined for the next decades to be in court? Under the RMA, yeah. uh, I don't know whether it's decades, and you know, RMA reform is on the yeah. on the table at the moment. So I, I hope we get a cleaner system. But certainly for the years to come, I I don't think that's going to go away. Um, but the some of the interesting pieces that we've done over the last couple of years are in that environmental space. I mean, the cost of getting to zero carbon by twenty. So you've done some work on that. Yeah, for the Ministry for the Environment. Are you optimistic that New Zealand is able? to hit those targets, or, or certainly doesn't seem to me the public policy is in place to do it yet. The public policy is not in place to do it yet, and that's being worked through, and um, my expectation is that it will hit some difficult walls. At this juncture, it's hard to see exactly what those walls are, but we, I think yeah. we've probably just stubbed our toe on one. It's yeah. that, you know, how do, how do you arbitrate between the, the interests of the farmers and the interests of, let's say, the tourism yeah. inter industry on, on, on water? You know, how do you resolve that tension? We're going to see that that everywhere in in the years to come, but no. In stepping back from it all, we 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 do some fascinating things. I mean, I'm because I'm a commercial guy myself. I come from that world. I uppermost in my mind ten, tend to perhaps be the more commercial things yeah. that we do for commercial clients, but they're unfortunately usually the ones I can't talk about the, publicly. The, the one you can talk about you yeah. did when I was at the EMA mm -hmm. and uh, the study on uh, congestion in yeah. Auckland. Which you know is a is a sore that just reappeared. I mean that's a report that keeps on giving. I mm. mean it's uh, I think we came up with a figure of over a billion dollars. I think, I think we lowballed it, yes. it actually the mm. number. I think but it's been repeated over and over again. Mm. Um, if you were to do that report again today, do you think the number has increased or decreased, or do you think we've got better at the congestion? Well, I'd say it's two years is probably not enough to make a yeah. difference. I mean there'll be some local changes obviously yes. when you know the bottlenecks are going in but that that's an interesting report I mean that that's gone into the mythology mm. of the Institute because that was a report that that um, pushed Jacinda off the the front page of the Herald because <laughs> it was it was when Jacinda was in her pomp she yeah. was fresh yeah. and new and interesting and and she was all over the headlines until we did that report and then yeah. we got the, the the front page and she didn't I mean the 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 disappointing thing about that report for me is, you know, the, the recommendation wa was essentially that we do some something around pricing to yes. get people out of the congested areas. There are different forms that that could take and that, that went into the into the political quicksand and instead we have a fuel tax yeah. which is which has no you know location it's made no effect at all like that's that. right yeah um but it's back on the agenda i mean the the whole question of cordons road pricing all that stuff yeah. does come back regularly so we're hopeful that perhaps somebody might might grab that and do something with it but it, it was a very as you said a very influential study how do you navigate the political biases that uh, you know, somebody writes a report and they want an answer mm. <laughs> that suits their particular uh, argument yes um do you walk away from work uh, if often if, oh yes if, if, if that's the position that we're going to be placed in uh, we walk we're small i mean we're, we're, we're 30 people and um for an organisation such as ours, independence is everything. So we, we have to be truth tellers. I mean, if we were captured by this faction or that faction, yeah. we'd be dead within five years. We just couldn't do it, even if we wanted to. So we we speak where the, where the data takes us. And, and that's difficult for some clients. And welcome for the more sophisticated clients, mm. because the more sophisticated a client is, the more they're interested in the, in the truth. What they do with the truth is over to them, but they, they, they want a genuinely independent, disinterested view of whatever their issue happens to be, and that's what we give them. So we live in a post-truth world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of information is populated from social media. Mm -hmm. uh, people are exposed to information almost at random. How do you deal with that? post-truth idea when in fact data is driving your business I think that's how we deal with it actually we try whenever we take a position or advise on something to a client we try and take it back down to what will the data support you know what is the evidence for this position um, sometimes it's clear 
but a lot of the time it isn't. And you know, when it's not clear where there are cases that can be made on either side of a position, which is very often the case, then we, we just lay that out. We say, you know, there's evidence. This this is the evidence for this position. This is the evidence for this position, and and we 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 set it out so that people can form a judgment. And so that's the f terms of reference are really important, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Oh, the yes. The kind of data that you're collecting. That, that that's right. But um, it would be very difficult in in an, in an organisation like NZIR to ignore data that bore on the question. One thing I can say is, having worked on some of these groups, is when smart people who may well be ideologically widely divided mm. look at the same information, mm. they generally come to similar conclusions, unless mm. they're willfully ignorant. Well, it's, it's great to hear. I agree, actually. The more, I think I said it before, yeah. the more sophisticated the, the client, the easier all that area of things mm. becomes. Um, it's when people are close to alternative views or, or have one perspective and won't, won't admit another perspective that we tend to have trouble. Those tend to be the walk away situations for us. So you are largely self-funding, in other words, you, the reports that you do have to pay for themselves so That's you right, can stay yeah. in business. That's right. Is there any philanthropy attached to the institute? Well, if you're offering, Kim, then <laughs> <laughs> no, there isn't. So yeah. there is like some in overseas, you know, the, yeah. the think tanks are funded by rich people who, who have a particular axe to grind. Uh, but my point here is there isn't that. There, there, there isn't. No, no. We it's project by. We also have a membership services which, uh, division, which is um, you sell publications. Isn't it? That's right. You know, so we um, the, our members get some forecast. They get the quarterly survey of business yeah. opinion, obviously, which is always influential, um, and that's part of our membership services offering. But no, we um, we don't have an endowment. I, a few years ago, we had John Daly out from the Grattan Institution yeah. in. Australia as the speaker at our AGM in Wellington and he he told me that uh, when he um, when they started they started with a federal endowment of 30 million dollars wow. well this is a different world <laughs> 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 you know we can't compete with that here yeah yeah I mean we've got uh, uh, some very interesting challenges uh, uh, coming up in, in New Zealand I'd like to circle back to something you said a minute ago about um, your I think it's monthly or quarterly survey. On yes, the business meeting, yes. And all over the newspapers right now is this mm. matter of business confidence. Mm. And I've heard a number of the government's po uh, leaders say, well, there is an issue here. Business just doesn't like labour. Mm. And let's accept maybe a percentage of that is true. Mm. But it's been naggingly going on. And, and I remember when they labour first came in, and I was still doing quite a lot of commentary of my own, I said, well, regardless of the cause of it, Ultimately, the confidence does manifest itself in poor investment because mm. people are con And now that we're seeing a, a year later, that exactly is what's happening. Mm. Um, if you were going to give the government advice, which you often do, what would you advise them to, just to try and turn this confidence around? Oh, that's a very hard question. I, I, first of all, I don't think that the explanation that it's a Labour-led government is a complete explanation. There is a whiff of that, but I don't, yeah. uh, I don't think that's completely true. I, I think actually what happened, and I will work around yeah. to answering your question directly in a moment, but I think what happened was the business community got a few surprises from the government very early in their term. Oil. I think even before that, the first was the lift in the minimum wage. Oh, yes. A and that's, you know, we're, we're seeing that. But that was an election promise. Yes, it was an election promise, so it started at the election yeah. at the election time, but that was the first thing. Then I think the restrictions on foreign ownership of properties um, made a lot of foreign yeah. investors, uh, yeah, a little bit, little bit uh, nervous with that. The oil was a big one, and the third one, and I don't think it was the decision, um, but the way that it was the taken, arbitrary nature of it, the yes. arbitrary nature of the the de decision, and and I think the the government accepts that. Capital but gains tax, maybe. Capital gains tax. I don't hear much noise about it at the moment. Do you? It well, was my the thing was, of course, um, to me. Uh, my greatest disappointment in our Prime Minister was that this was a die-in-the-ditch election promise. Mm -hmm. And when uh, the recommendation came from their report, um, she was nowhere to be seen in promoting it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the end, she made it. And, I and of course, there were the three dissenters as well. Yeah, but, but OK, fair enough. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of selling the idea to the business community, she was nowhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was disappointed in that because that was something, OK, fight the battle and lose, and I think mm -hmm. respect you for that. but. Mm -hmm. 
she outsourced most of that promotional work to Michael Cullen and others. Right. Um, and so she left the business community completely behind, many of whom actually had made up their minds that they could live with it. Mm. Now, there was a cacophony coming from the rural sector, which probably was going to bury it anyway. But I think there are a large percentage of the business community said, well, if it's not done in too complicated a way, they, they could live with it. Mm. Well, it's now, it's gone. Well, it's not unusual overseas. Of course, no, of course you know, not, no. um, regardless I, I, of how much money it raises. I mean, we all know this. it's yeah. inefficient. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's only a social equity discussion, uh, really. But I think that's probably what killed it here. And, and, and I think um, in, the, in the popular view, so not in the policy community, no. but in the popular, popular view, the, the thing that changed throughout that campaign, if we can call it that, was at the beginning, I think most people thought that the capital gains tax was about people with big houses in Remuera yeah. and hitting those guys because, you know, they're the one percenters, yeah. you know, we, we don't like the one percenters, yeah. you know, they're, they're evil, you're evil. Um, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> indeed, we know that. Um, um, and what changed is it's also plumbing businesses in Henderson. And I think, you know, that anybody who works from home and... The uh, middle strand. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, right. So, pl you know, plumbers in H Henderson, you know, I don't know, um, electricians in Avondale. I think little by little, um, the, the government came to the realisation that those people felt disadvantaged. And the New Zealand First voters, many of them. And, and perhaps uh, that yeah. I haven't seen, but, um, yeah. but, but I, I think that's probably what killed it. It, it was, you know, what, what we call the incidents on the tax, who it falls on and how it affects them, uh, that really shifted in the course of the capital gains tax debate. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and what concerns me is that by not actually addressing the business confidence, mm. it's this recession everyone's talking about, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it doesn't need to be one. Because mm. if you look at our fundamentals, they're good, aren't they? But the fundamentals are good. Uh, they're, they're perhaps not as strong as they were a few years yeah, back, yeah. but they're still not bad. You know, we're, 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 we're not a basket case economy or anything like that. Far from it. The fundamentals here are very good. But just coming back to the business confidence um, pattern, I think those three decisions in the early months uh, destroyed a lot of goodwill or, or muted yes. a lot of goodwill and there's nothing that's really happened since then that's that's been able to restore that goodwill you know they're, 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 you know what what a, could you name the large business friendly measure that this coalition has brought in so far <laughs> you know that that would make business people well, the, feel they the, want to invest. Minister or, Jones sprinkling money like fairy dust is certainly in the regions, very popular. Uh, the Bank of Shane, yes. The, uh, but, um, I happen to think that actually doing regional development work is mm. actually not a bad idea. Oh no, look, as yeah. long as you're not building white elephants, and I know Minister, Minister yeah. Jones under, understands this. He doesn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, Remember, half the money will be trees, which they, they promised right, yeah. to, to do anyway, and perhaps revitalise the forestry industry. Um, but no, mussels yeah. in Whakatane, if there's a commercial yeah. case for it, do it. Coming back to your other interests, yes. now I know that whilst when you're trying to put your footprint on New Zealand's public policy, also you're interested in music, is that right? That's, yes, that's, that's completely correct, yes. And uh, tell us a little bit about your musical background and interests. Oh golly, where to start? Um, that started very early when I was a, a small kid. Um, I, um, there, was, uh, there, there was an old violin that had been my mum's um, kicking around the house and I learned to play that. Um, I went to a teacher for that most of the time. We also were one of those houses that had an ancient piano in the living room, and but this thing, this, this was the most terrible beast you've ever seen. Um, I don't know how many of your viewers are, are musical people, but it worked for two and a half octaves from that C to that G. And so I got really good at getting sheet music and crunching everything into those two and a half octaves so I could play it. Um, Scott Joplin would sound great. <laughs> that works very well. Other things not so well, actually. Um, so yeah, I was the king of the vampers by the time I was a, a teenager. and. Um, and then uh, at school, I mean, I mentioned I do college. Yeah. That had had a before I was there, but it had had a very good musical tradition, and all the orchestral instruments were were there. So I, after my third form year, I worked a deal with a music teacher that he'd let me take one home every holiday so I could learn to play it. Um, and that's what I did. I just worked through. So the it's been a lifelong interest. Hasn't oh it? yes, yeah. And, and I was hopeless at some. This is. This is one of the great tricks with music, I think, actually matching the person to the in instrument. <laughs> there, there must be some black art in that that I can't divulge, because your know, woodwind instruments, I was good at the oboe, I was good at the bassoon, I was good at the saxophone, bizarrely, I was unbelievably awful at the flute and clarinet. 
funny, but just, sort of just I, terrible, just just appallingly bad. Fast forward now, of course. I think you're patron of a choir. Tell us about the choir. Ah, the Graduate Choir of New Zealand. Yes, that's a, a choir that has its origins and a lot of its membership in South Auckland, um, and so the famous. Penne. The famous Penapati, that's <laughs> right, and 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 Amitai as well, his yeah. his brother who's also doing well. So these are two thirds of Sole Mio, um, <laughs> are so Sol to Mio, perhaps you might yeah. call them, are from the graduate choir, and um, they do a marvelous, varied repertoire that crosses the centuries and crosses the genres, but they do it to an unbelievably high standard, and um, and I, I just think it's marvelous what they do. The sound is unique, you know, when you're listening to the graduate choir, I think you are listening to what Auckland oh, sounds like. It's as close like. as heaven you're ever going to get, I think. Yeah, um, and, and so that's been a marvellous association that I've had over the last uh, four years. I bring the music up for a very important reason. It, it, some people would think, oh, well, public policy economics is as dry yeah. as a bone. Mm. But actually, the interest in music and the dynamics that sit mm. underneath it, and perhaps the emotional responses, are very much part of our humanity. Yes. And I don't think that you can separate public policy from humanity. Mm. It's just a personal belief. Do you think that background in you has made a difference in the way you view the work and the way you work with people? I'm sure it must have done, um, but I'm not sure I could say exactly how. Uh, I agree with you. I mean, I, I don't find economics dry at all, actually, because at its core, it's about who gets what resources. Mm. That's what economics is. You know, it's not about you know forecasting exchange rates or anything. That's one thing it can do. But you know, we've got unlimited needs, finite resources. Who gets what and why? Mm. You know, that's that's economics, and uh, in that tension is a lot of human history and a lot of human passion and a lot of human emotion. Mm. And we see that whenever we see something contentious um, in in politics yeah. or or in the press and the media, whatever it might be. Um, so I agree with. Um, I don't yeah. find economics dry. I find it actually endlessly fascinating. So in your happiest and darkest moments, <laughs> I'm asking you to choose the your world famous best piece of music that lifts your spirits most, what would you be playing? Oh gosh, that, uh, that's an impossible question. Uh, <laughs> what would I be Mozart playing or what would I be playing? surely. Or no, what would I be playing or listening to? Overture to Turandot, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Bach St. Matthew Passion. Of course, powerful. Powerful. Powerful and... And, and, and comprehensive, uh, everything is in that piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, well, that's actually a very good choice. Uh, and uh, at least it's not a requiem. <laughs> at least it's not a requiem, no. <laughs> Although the protagonist does die partway through, yeah. but he does rise again. Uh, and I, it, the, the, your last comment for our viewers, and you're now going to talk to our younger audiences, uh, uh, you're growing up in South Auckland. What do you recommend to have a successful career in life? Don't be limited by growing up in South Auckland. Go to the library, read. I mean, the internet's a marvelous thing. You can get all kinds of information about all kinds of things on the internet. There's a reason why some of that information is free. We have to allow for that. But no, don't be don't be limited by your circumstances. You know, you know lift yourself beyond that and look beyond the walls of the ghetto. That's the thing that really makes the difference, I think. What a wonderful, positive way to end our show. Lawrence uh, Kubiak, thank you for being on Business at the Speed of Coffee. Thank you, Kim.